Hi everybody. Hope you're all having a good day today so far. Today we're going to be talking about the maximum theorem. Now, some people refer to this as the theorem of the maximum. Uh, some people call it Berge's theorem, but I think today most people refer to this as just the maximum theorem. Now, what's the maximum theorem all about and what does it do for us? Well, the maximum theorem is just used all the time in various parts of economics, and like just about all parts of economics. It is in, used in demand theory, it's applied in theory of the firm, uh, to optimal growth theory, to game theory, and lots of other places in economics and game theory. And uh, what does the theorem actually do for us? It tells us, it gives us information about the solution function and the value function in situations where the solution function is actually a correspondence and not a single valued function because we're looking at optimization problems where there may be multiple optimal solutions, multiple solutions that have the same optimal value so that we need to use a solution correspondence and not a solution function and that's where the maximum theorem comes in and that's why it is used so much in economics. So uh, let's take a look at the theorem first and then we will look at two or three applications of the theorem to some of the some of the items here. So maximum theorem. We will assume that we have two sets in Euclidean spaces. One set we'll call X. That'll be in Euclidean space, say RL. We have another set we'll call capital E. That's going to be a subset of Euclidean space as well, but it's not necessarily the same dimensional, the same, the same Euclidean space. And now I'm going to write over here in a different color the interpretation that we usually make of the various items in the maximum theorem in applications, and then we'll look at some applications as well. So, and I'm going to do that in a different color because I want to emphasize that these aren't really part of the theorem, but they're essential in understanding the theorem and in applying the theorem. So, the elements of X here, let's say X, little x is in capital X, those are alternative actions that the decision maker is going to choose from amongst. The decision maker is going, to, is going to choose one of the elements of X as the action that he or she is going to take, and the elements of capital E, for which we'll use little e, those are environments or parameter values, environments that the alternative environments that the decision maker uh, faces, find, may find himself or herself in. And so let's go right over here immediately, even though we've got more to do in the theorem, let's go over here and try to follow along with one of the primary applications of the theorem, and that's going to be to demand theory. So, and I'll continue to use orange here because it's an application, and so we'll say in demand theory, capital X will be the consumption space, the space of consumption bundles. And so the elements of capital X, those are going to be bundles, and this will be a subset of RL plus, because we don't talk about negative amounts of, of various goods in a consumption bundle. And those are going to be then consumption bundles. Uh, the environments, those will be price lists and wealth or budget levels that the consumer uh, has to spend. And those will be in some space of parameter values. Those are the parameters. And that will be a subset of R L plus 1 
plus. There's going to be just as many prices as there are goods, but then we have this budget level or wealth level here, and so that's going to be price list and let's say budget or wealth uh, pairs pairs, and we've got a price list P and a W, but of course this is not a single real number, this is a a vector or an L-tuple. And so let's come back over here to the theorem. So the next item in the theorem we have is an objective function. And that's defined with a domain of X cross E, and that maps into real numbers, objective or utility type function. And we have a feasible set correspondence, which maps from the environments into the set of possible actions. And so this is a, an objective function. I'll just write that as OBJ, objective function. And this is the uh, feasible set. The feasible set correspondence. I'll just write CORR for correspondence here. And so for demand theory, this, of course, is the consumer's utility function. So I'll write that as U, utility function. So it'll still be the same, the same letter we'll use as a notation. And we'll say that goes from um, X, since we have a cross E here, I hear we have we're using theta is playing the role of capital E. So that would be here. And that maps into the reals. And so that's the consumer's utility function, and the feasible set correspondence in consumer theory, demand theory, that's going to be the budget set correspondence, and I'll use beta, the same notation we've used before for the budget set correspondence, and that maps from parameter values, price, price wealth pairs, price budget pairs, uh, and it's a correspondence, and so it maps from there into capital X, and that's the budget set correspondence. Now you'll notice one thing that looks a little odd here, and that is a little unusual and something we haven't probably uh, encountered quite before, and that is I've got the utility function defined over not just consumption bundles, but also over price wealth, price budget pairs. Uh, parameters that are typically exogenous to the consumer. So we don't usually think of the utility function as the consumer's preferences as depending on the, uh, these exogenous prices or the exogenous budget amount. But, but of course, if we want to use the utility function in the usual sense, where utility just depends on uh, the, uh, the, the consumption bundle, then we can just say this function goes from x cross theta, but is independent of the value of p and w. That is, it's constant with respect to this uh, argument. So it just depends on, on what's in x. But, of course, we could allow the utility function to depend on prices or wealth or the amount of the budget or both. And so this framework would actually allow us to do demand theory in situations where the consumer, the consumer's preferences actually do depend on, uh, on the price, the prices of the goods. And so it gives us a little extra, extra power here. Let's come back to the theorem over here now. And so what we need to do now is we need to actually define the solution correspondence and the uh, value function. So the solution correspondence, of course, goes from the environments, and it's a correspondence, into the actions. And we want to define as well the value function, which goes from environments into the reals. 
and we want to define those as follows. We want to say for any environment, the solution set for that environment is the set of all actions in the feasible set for that environment such that X maximizes the utility function fixing the environment maximizes the utility function among the uh, actions that are actually available at that environment and the value function is of course just going to be the maximum value uh, over the x's in just the feasible set uh, and again, that would be a uh, maximum of x e. And we could think of that, I'm going to put that in quotation marks, as the utility at mu of e. And that's the way we would write it normally if the solution correspondence was a function, so that that was a single action. But of course, this is a set, so that's why I put this in quotation marks. That isn't really exactly well defined, but it's pretty clear what it means. So <clears throat> that would be the uh, solution correspondence and the value function. And so uh, I won't write the names of those here, but that's what we've got here. But let's come back over here now and see what these are in the application to demand theory. And of course, the solution correspondence would be the demand correspondence. And so we might use, say, capital D for the name of the demand correspondence. It's a, co it's a correspondence because there can be, at a given price list and budget, there could be multiple bundles that maximize the consumer's utility. So this goes from environments or parameters into the action space, the bundles, and so this is the consumer's demand correspondence, and of course the value function is the indirect utility function. Indirect utility function. So this is the application of the maximum theorem to demand theory, but of course we don't yet have the actual statement of the theorem. We just have the framework in which the theorem, the theorem's assumption and, conclu and consequent or conclusion is going to be framed. And the same thing over here. We have our demand theory, but this hasn't said anything about the demand correspondence or the indirect utility function yet. So to do that, we're going to write down the, the theorem now, or the rest of the theorem, that's more than just the framework. So if the utility function, let's just make that u, I won't put the parentheses here, if u, if the utility function is continuous, and the, the uh, feasible set correspondence is both continuous and compact valued, then now we have the conclusion of the maximum theorem, which is what, which is what the theorem is act, what the work the theorem is actually doing. It's what it's actually doing for us. And that is that the solution correspondence is upper hemi continuous and the value function is continuous. 
So over here, of course, that simply says that the demand correspondence, so let's actually write this here, if U is continuous and uh, beta is continuous and compact valued, then the demand correspondence is upper Hamming continuous and the value function, the indirect utility function, is continuous. You know, I just realized that I left something out in the theorem here. And this is something that is, uh, it's an issue that you will never encounter in practice, but it's something we need in order to make sure that everything in the theorem is well defined. And that is, we need to assume that the feasible set correspondence is always non-empty valued. That is, that the feasible set is always a non-empty set. So I'm going to write that like this for... Uh, every E in capital E, phi of E is not the empty set. So we say that, that, that phi, the correspondence phi, is non-empty value. Non-empty value, of course, everywhere in the domain. Now I've said that that's not something you'll ever encounter in practice, and the reason for that is that if we have any correspondence that's continuous, that is, both upper and lower hemicontinuous, then it will be non-empty valued everywhere, just like this, or it will be empty valued everywhere in the domain. That is, it can't be non-empty valued on part of the domain and empty valued on the other part of the domain. So since the feasible set correspondence, because it's going to be assumed to be continuous, is going to be either non-empty valued everywhere or empty valued everywhere, you won't encounter this in practice because you are not going to encounter in practice a feasible set situation, a feasible set correspondence that is where the feasible set is everywhere the empty set. Then we'd be talking about maximizing some objective function always on an empty set. Doesn't really make any sense, and in particular, the value function then wouldn't even be well defined. So we do need to add this assumption, and that's sometimes left out. This is easy to forget. I forgot it. <laughs> easy to forget when one is writing down the theorem. But again, in practice, even if you forget it, it isn't really going to matter because you aren't going to be applying this to a situation where uh, this assumption fails. So uh, there's now two or three uh, additional things that uh, we need to say about the theorem here. And so the first is that we have these three remarks down here that tell us some additional properties of the solution correspondence in addition to the fact that it's upper hemicontinuous if the assumptions in the theorem are satisfied. First, that the solution correspondence is going to be always non-empty valued itself, and that's, of course, just applying the Weierstrass theorem to the fact that the objective function is continuous and the uh, feasible set is always non-empty and compact valued. So apply the Weierstrass theorem, the solution at any point in the, envir in the environment is, uh, is going to be uh, non-empty. There, there will be at least one maximizer. The second remark here is that the uh, solution correspondence is a closed correspondence, and that just follows immediately from a result uh, that we saw in a previous lecture, where if we have a correspondence that's both upper hemicontinuous and is closed valued, then it will be a closed correspondence. And of course, here we see that the solution correspondence is upper hemicontinuous, and its closed valued is a trivial consequence of the fact that it consists 
of the maximizers, the, uh, the actions, the elements of X, that maximize a continuous function. And so the set of maximizers of a continuous function is trivially always a closed set. So the, uh, the solution correspondence is operandi continuous and closed valued. So it is therefore a closed correspondence. And third, in those regions of the domain where the uh, solution correspondence is singleton valued, that is, those regions of the domain where it's an, actually a function, single valued function, the, uh, the function will necessarily be continuous because it's an upper hemi, it's upper hemi continuous as a correspondence, which when it's singleton valued is equivalent to being a continuous function. So, for example, in our application to demand theory, these tell us that the demand correspondence will everywhere be non-empty valued. There will always be some bundle that maximizes the consumer's utility, possibly multiple bundles, that it will be a closed correspondence. And in the regions of the domain where it is a function, where it's singleton valued, it'll be a continuous demand function. And finally, one more thing we should say is that this assumption that the feasible set correspondence is compact valued, that the image set, the feasible set, is always compact. That is a strong assumption. And in fact, we've seen that as an issue in one or two previous lectures. For example, when we looked at the budget set correspondence and noticed that if we had any prices that were zero, and this is the consumption set, let's say all of RL plus, then our budget set would be unbounded, therefore not compact, and of course then the uh, solution correspondence, the solution set would be empty. We wouldn't have a, we wouldn't typically have a maximizer. So in applying the maximum theorem in any particular situation to demand theory, theory of the firm as we'll see, uh, game theory, we need to find some way to ensure that the, uh, the uh, feasible set correspondence will be compact valued. The feasible set will always be compact in this, in this application here. That the budget set will be compact. And in demand theory, we do that in one of two ways, generally. We either find some way to restrict the consumption set to a bounded subset of RL plus, in which case, of course, then the budget set correspondence will always be bounded valued. That is, the budget set will always be bounded. And of course, it will be closed. So we've got a compact budget set, compact valued budget correspondence. Or alternatively, we restrict the set of parameter values, the set of environments here, the prices, the wealth, in particular the prices, to price lists that don't have any zero prices. Because as long as all the prices are positive, then again, the budget set is going to be both closed and bounded. So it'll always be compact. So either one of those two ways is a kind of approach that we take, a kind of trick in some sense that we employ to make sure that the budget set correspondence is uh, compact valued in demand theory, and therefore the maximum theorem applies, and we can, we, can, we can use it. So that's it for the maximum theorem in application to demand theory. What we'll do next time is we will uh, look at a couple, two or three additional applications to theory of the firm, production theory, to uh, at least one situation in game theory and perhaps a third application. So that's what we'll be doing, uh, that's what we'll do next time. And so uh, that's it for today. See you all next time.